hello to Joy Egbert, who's here in Japan for the first time at the mm -hmm. Jolt Call Conference in Kyoto. How are you enjoying it so far? I love it. It's been one of the most exciting, not only the conference, but just being here in Kyoto. The weather's perfect, the people are amazing. The fun thing for me is that many of the people I've heard about or uh, written with or done other things with um, that I've never seen before, I've gotten to meet face to face. Mm. And that's really fun. And it was interesting because yesterday, um, when, when I saw you for the first time, you seemed to be very um, relaxed with, with the organizer of this conference, and I assumed that you'd been working here or you, you had some um, closer connection in that way, but nope. you hadn't met them face to face? Well, I knew Tom Robb. Mm. I've known him for many years because uh, he was one of the organizers often of the Electronic Village for TESOL, okay. and so that's how we met originally, and, mm. and some of the states-based people, but mm. um, Glenn and... Uh, Kevin Ryan, who I've written with and done other things with, never seen before. Mm. So Very interesting what yeah. we can do these days. Um, so, to start off with, I'd just like to know a little bit more about how you got into teaching and, and when you started and, and how you got to where you are now. Hmm. Well, when I was younger, maybe in high school, I had dreams of being a ballerina, being a politician, um, being... Uh, someone who could travel overseas in some capacity, all these other things. And I figured out that as a teacher, I can do every single one of those things. I can dance in front of my class, I can sing, you know, I can do all those things. And so that attracted me immediately. And ESL came up because um, I'd always wanted to travel overseas. I love learning about new cultures, new kinds of people, new ways of thinking and trying to incorporate them into my life or whatever. And um, I had no idea about, I've never heard of ESL until I was at the Grand Canyon in the United States, Grand Canyon National Park, working one summer mm. on my way to doing a, a foreign or an international studies degree to join the Foreign Service. Mm. And I saw an article about the program at Arizona and I thought immediately, that's really what I want to be, an mm. ESL teacher, because I can do all those things. Mm. And from there, it's kind of taken off. And you were always in the U.S., did you travel? Um, I. I've taught and studied in Russia mm. and other places, so uh, I've been in Turkey and Singapore and mm. Taiwan and other places like that. What did you take um, from each place? Was there anything that uh, particularly stands out? It, it stands out that there are a lot of major commonalities that we really need to work on. I think Larry Davies talked today about organizational change, mm. and I think that's something we really need to take into consideration because organizations, big organizations are really stopping teachers from engaging their students and doing all those things that we keep saying they're supposed to be able to do, that the research shows are important. Um, so I think that's the main thing. And the other thing is that here in Japan, I've, I was a little bit discouraged the first day when I heard teachers saying, um, you, you can't do anything here, you can't change, you can't do something different. And I think you still can. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of teachers are kind of a little bit burnt out and I wish they would uh, there, I wish I had some way to help them rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess that leads us on to the talk that you did yesterday, which was engaging with the learners. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I don't want to be negative either. It, it's true that we often say, oh, well, this is stopping us from doing something, right. and, and there are these, these obstacles to us. Mm -hmm. um, but it is often, not often, but it is the case sometimes that the students are willing to do something new um, or even demanding it, and the teachers are very willing and excited. But there are obstacles, institutional obstacles. So how can we go about changing our institution? Let's be positive. Mm -hmm. um, I talked at breakfast this morning with some of the other talk call members and we were talking about this because yesterday during the presentation, um, it, there was when I was talking about groundswell, mm. there was kind of a, well, here are the reasons there can't be a groundswell. But what I tell my pre-service teachers, even my in-service teachers who are looking to do something different is that once you go into your classroom and close the door, it's your classroom. Mm -hmm. and, and how you meet the goals that anyone has set out for you, no matter how strict they are, be on this page on this day. I mean, we have that in the States, too. Mm. Um, how you do that page and how your students are interacting with that page mm. is up to you as the teacher. So, and I think that, it, well, there's two ways to think about it. When the students go and say, oh, I love Dr. Egbert's class, it's so exciting, I'm so engaged, mm. you know, either that will get me in trouble, mm. or the other teachers will say, hey, Joy, you know, what are you doing in that class that I can do? Mm. So, um, I think if it's I think if it's done well, it's up to each individual teacher to kind of take on that responsibility and say, um, yeah, I, I really want to engage my students and I'm going to do what I can up to the limits of what I'm allowed to do. 
Can you tell us the hummingbird story that you told yesterday? Yeah, apparently it's on YouTube, okay. so people can go look at it too. But um, and I'm not sure if I explained well enough what it meant, but uh, apparently there was a forest fire and the animals were running out of the forest mm -hmm. and, um, you know, making a beeline to get away from the fire. And the hummingbird stopped at the pond and picked up a drop of water and went and put it on the fire mm -hmm. and came back and picked up another drop of water and came back and put it on the fire. And the other animals stopped for a minute and said, Hummingbird, you know, you're not going to be able to put out that fire. What are you doing? And the hummingbird said, the best I can. And I think that if we each, you know, put a couple drop of water, couple drops of water on that fire, uh, some of that fire is going to go out. Mm. So we've all got to do the best that we can. Mm -hmm. I guess. So, all right, okay. Um, you showed us a couple of uh, video clips during the, um, the talk yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and the first one you showed us was... Uh, made in, I guess, an American university. Yes. Um, and it was the student sending a message that, um, you know, i am I'm got my laptop open in your class, but I'm not listening to your lecture, and um, I'm, I'm on Facebook, and, and, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and what, what struck me about that um, video, and, and I do hear this, I see this kind of thing um, around, is that do you think we can extrapolate or we can... We can um, apply that information universally? Or do you think it is a little bit specific to, to perhaps the context that you're working in? I think what we can take in a more global sense mm. is that we need to understand what our students are doing and mm. who they are in order to meet their needs. Mm. Um, I think that American students use software differently or use technology differently in some ways mm. at, at different ages for different things than students other places. Mm. But that's not the point. The point is that we need to know what they're doing mm. in order to meet their needs. Okay. Um, so this, this goes on to a book that you've got coming out this year, right, uh, that you're editing, which mm -hmm. is about using technology in, in limited technology context. Right. Can you tell us about that? Uh, it's a fabulous edited volume. Um, and it's set up by regions of the world. Hmm. So we have Asia, Africa, we, we did every continent. Well, okay, six continents. Hmm. And what, they, what everyone did, and some of these authors have never written in the ESL um, or EFL area before. Hmm. So we got people who are really in the trenches, teachers, who are facing different kinds of limitations. And it's not just hardware. Hmm. Um, a lot of people think that limited technology means, oh, we don't have enough computers for everybody. But it's not that, necessarily. There's, there are all kinds of barriers to the use of effective uh, technology effectively. And so we've looked at, in this book, almost any barrier that you could think of that would stop teachers from being effective and giving answers or, or solutions. And some of them are absolutely fabulous, things I would never have thought of mm. before these authors who are, you know, doing their best. They're all like little hummingbirds mm -hmm. um, who are working to, to overcome all of these things that a lot of teachers seem to have succumbed to already. So. I just think, and it's so well written, that the teachers did it, um, they start with an anecdote that te other teachers can relate to to kind of pull them in and connect to their teaching mm -hmm. situations, a little bit of background, and then s explicit um, explanations of what they can do mm -hmm. to, to help their students in spite of mm -hmm. whatever the limitations are. Oh, it's, it's really interesting, and I'm really excited about I, it. I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. Yeah. Um, can you remember the Japanese chapter? No, but probably Leslie Huff did it because she's in Hokkaido. Okay. So, um, and there are other Asian. I think we have Taiwan, China, and I'm not sure else, where else in Asia. I can't mm -hmm. remember. But um, the really interesting. Well, one of the really interesting mm -hmm. things, because the whole book is interesting, is that a lot of people in a lot of different places that you wouldn't expect are mm -hmm. facing the exact same barriers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is administration or government rules or whatever it is. And boy, the creativity that some of these people are exhibiting mm -hmm. in, in circumventing those is just amazing. So the um, similarities between the situation in Nigeria mm -hmm. and maybe Taiwan or um, Turkey or somewhere, mm -hmm. wow. I mean, then you think, ah, so there are some things that, you know, we really need to think about in a more global sense to, to overcome. So do we, uh, do you think we need to use technology? Need to use technology. Mm -hmm. I think there are some circumstances in which technology makes things more effective and more efficient for our students, and that's the point. Um, I think there are many instances where technology is used where it shouldn't be and where we don't need to. So it's, for me, it's contextual. It mm -hmm. depends. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, you talked about uh, you talked about flow and, and, and flow theory is something that you've um, you've written about before and mm -hmm. that you've, you've researched as well. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain to us what flow theory is and where it came from and how it applies to the 
uh, English classroom? Well, right now, um, different people are taking a look at flow. So mm. Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who is the original or the originator of the theory, mm. um, said that there are four basic um, criteria for a flow experience, which means a very deeply engaging experience in which you don't notice. So if you've read a book in your native language mm. where somebody suddenly calls you and you're like, oh, it's night already? Mm. That was flow. So it's those instances where you don't see time passing and it's so engaged, deeply engaging. Anyway, um, what they're saying now is kind of they've distilled it down into there's a challenge on one axis and skills on the other axis, and right in the middle is the flow channel. Mm. So if it's too easy for students, they'll be bored. If it's too hard for students, they'll be anxious. Mm. But if the challenge, challenge and the skills balance, then they'll be in flow. Mm. So that's kind of the main thing that's coming out of it now. So how can we maximize the flow? Well, we have to understand what challenges our students. Right. Um, and a challenge doesn't mean just, is it hard enough? It means, is it interesting and hard enough, mm. in a way? And then what skills they can bring or what, how we can help. So it also ties into Vygotsky's idea of... Personal uh, development. Zone proximal development. Exactly. And yes, zone of proximal development. Mm. So, um, who's going to be there helping you? You know, have enough skills mm. to meet that challenge. Mm. So, um, is there any research to show that, that reaching this kind of flow channel uh, has a positive impact on, on language acquisition? Not or? yet, but I mean, it's ripe for study. Mm. Now that we've kind of set up how it can be studied, trying you know, triangulating data, doing kind of some counting, some some observing, some other things. It's it's a great actually, mm. and I have to say that they are doing a lot of. Um, in other countries, not so much in the States, and I haven't seen anything come out of the UK, but in Turkey, they're doing a lot of flow research. I get uh, information or, or requests from students there all the time for some of my citations, that kind of stuff. So there is, there are things coming up um, based in language learning, so I'll be interested to read those and hopefully other people so will be too. The theory itself is only 20 something years old, right? Right. Um, and it was, and, and it wasn't originally a, a language. Um, Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, another motivation theory. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it applies very well. And that's what I was trying to find out in my Modern Language Journal article. You know, does it exist? Can it exist in classrooms when teachers are doing drills and it goes from person to person, you're counting ahead to see which number you know, you're going to do? Mm -hmm. are, are you really absorbed in the language? And um, we found out that the use of technology can actually support you know, micro flow experiences at least. And so that for me was when you ask, do we need to use technology, it's, yeah, if it leads to flow, we do. So micro flow, I like that idea. Yeah, so shorter flow experiences, mm. deep but short. Okay, oh, that's very nice. Um, so you're, you're working um, with uh, doctoral students as well now mm -hmm. and, and also teacher training. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit about teacher training? Depends, what do you want well, to know? Well, I mean, what, what, what your involvement is with teacher training and what... Uh, what you feel about it. Um, in the States we have several ways that teachers can understand how to teach ESL students. They can get an ESL endorsement, so that's a series of kind of intensive classes, and they get a certificate at the end. And then there's pre-service teachers, and all of the pre-service teachers now are required to take one course about teaching students that have di from different language backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really come through a lot of development. Um, there's There are arguments about what teachers need to be able to teach language learners. Some people say they need the linguistics, they need to understand English language very well. And others say, well, they need to be educators. They need to figure out how to figure out what students need to know and how to present it, those kind of things. And for me, it's a balance. Um, but the courses are so short that we really focus on um, what are the ways to engage students and making connections and um, figuring out their needs and those kind of things are where we're focusing now and that's the second book that's coming out in June. Okay, this is about uh, K-12? Yes. Okay, yeah, that, that also looks very interesting. It's I mean, coming out from Pearson, it's called Access to Academics okay. and there's a subtitle but yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what it is right now. <laughs> so, and it's about how do we go about planning or designing um, lessons that engage students by using those features of you know, a lot of content teachers, uh, so math or science or whatever, don't even think about the language they, they use. Mm -hmm. They say that's the ESL or the EFL teacher's job, and mm -hmm. we don't have to do that. And this book says, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. um, they're, the genre of science, the genre of math, the genre of social studies are all so different. And there's some been, been some great articles, actually, in the ESL Outlook, mm -hmm. especially uh, about math. Mm -hmm. 
and you say, oh, yeah, I see now. And so um, one of the things we're trying to do is get those teachers to incorporate language objectives hmm. into their, what language do students need to be able to access the content? Hmm. And then our language teachers say, okay, today we're going to do past tense. Oh, the students are going to uh, do a role play in past tense. Hmm. And I say, let's look at it a little bit deep, more deeply. What do they need in order to be able to do a role play? Hmm. They don't just need past tense, they need um, some kind of strategies to be how, they, how they're supposed to interact in the language and, and all kinds of other things. So um, we're trying to bring the content and the language together mm. in, in ways that make sense and are kind of simple for teachers so they don't say, no, that's too much trouble or I don't have time to do that. It's, mm. You can do that. Yeah, that's something that Larry alluded to as well today was uh, um, when you're training teachers, you need to give them... Uh, a simpler option. You don't have to give them the most difficult, the most complicated thing right. to do. Um, okay, well one more thing I wanted to talk about. You, you mentioned Electronic Village Online. Um, what, what's your involvement with, with them? Now it's nothing, yeah. but in the past I've been part of the call intersection for TESOL and um, helped them set up and, and mm. figure out what they were going to do and um, uh, participate in some of their workshops. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I know that TESO is, is the, the U.S. equivalent to, um, to JALT, of right. course, but it's much, much bigger and yeah. much more international. Well, it's supposed to be international, right, yeah. so people from around the world attend. Well, I, as I'm from the U.K., I'm more familiar with IA TEFL. I'm a member of IA TEFL, right. but not TESOL. Can you tell us a bit more about TESOL and just enlighten me? Well, they say they're the international organization, mm. and what I found is that um, the first several years when I went there, there were hundreds of new teaching techniques mm. that I'd never heard of. Um, now I go for the research. Mm. Um, and that part of it is a, a bit smaller. It's more, for me, it's more of a practitioner conference. Mm. But really the people around the world who are deeply involved in research in English language learning, not necessarily you know, call or any of those things, mm. go to the conference. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's not sitting at their presentations that you learn things, it's going to the breakfast with them and, you know, talking to mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. having those kind of discussions. Mm -hmm. What I really like is that there's also a PhD forum now and a master's forum. Mm -hmm. So PhD and master's students get hooked up with a mentor, someone really well known in the field, mm -hmm. in their field, and, and have a year to work with them, ask them for advice, you know, those kind of things, and that's been really fabulous. Hmm. Well, the, the Electronic Village Online has these free online courses every year, which are fantastic. Right, and they're not one-shot deals. I mm. mean, they go on, and you develop a support system mm -hmm. with teachers around the world, and so it's it's a really nice thing to be part of. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, the final thing, I guess, is uh, do you have a, a, a kind of final message for, for any teachers out there who are feeling a bit burnt out and overwhelmed and, and uh, uh, really want to engage with their students, what would you say to, to a teacher? Kind of two things. Mm. First, eat more chocolate. <laughs> and the second one is um, take a step back and take a breath and think, okay, I'm going to do one small thing today mm. or this week or this month that, that I'm going to test to see if it involves it, my students more, see if it engages mm. my students more. Um, I, I think even in my presentation yesterday, it sounds like it's all or nothing. Mm. You follow all the rules or you don't do any of the rules, but it's really take a, a small piece of one rule and try to implement it in your classroom. Um, you know, do one activity and see how it goes and test the waters so that it's not so overwhelming. And that's the same thing for call, right? We say, you know, use one piece of a technology t that you know well first. Use your flip video or whatever, your video camera, or whatever it is, um, and get comfortable with it and then move on and try something else. You don't have to do a completely computerized classroom the first time you do any lessons, so. Hey, well, thank you very much, Joy. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.